Yeah. All right, just, just going to take a second to make sure it starts. And then I'll have to close all my windows. Oh, take a second to, to make sure it's... <laughs> Sorry, that's the feedback. And are we muting ourselves when we're not talking? Um, do you have a way to do that on your end? Yeah. yeah. You, you know what? If you don't mind, sure. If it's not too much trouble. Okay, if I remember, yeah. Yeah, because I'm not going to remember. Okay, so I don't know if anybody is watching, but here we are. Um, this is the virtual cast Q&A uh, for the animated short film Dragonfly that is created by myself, Julia Morizawa. This was a perk sort of uh, thing as part of the um, crowdfunding campaign that is going on right now. We're actually in the last week. So if you don't know about it, if for some reason you're watching this and you don't know about it, um, you can check it out over at uh, dragonflyshortfilm.com. And we have some members of my amazing voice overcast here with us today. Um, I didn't tell you guys this, but if you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves, just name or whatever is fine. Um, Mia, you want to start? Hi there, my name is Mia Kodama. <laughs> Yay! Okay, uh, Kazumi? Hi, I'm Kazumi Aihara. How are you guys? And Thomas. Hi, I'm Thomas Isao Morinaka. Greetings and salutations. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. All right, so um, I guess we can just jump right into it. If anybody has any questions um, over there, you should just be able to uh, pop them into the chat, both on either YouTube or Facebook, and it's supposed to show up over here on my end. So I will try and keep an eye. I'm going to try and multitask and keep my eye on that as much as possible. But um, I wanted to start off with the first question. This is actually a question for my for that I was actually curious to know myself because so the process with um, essentially casting all of you uh, was an example of like the multiple ways that uh, I find people to work with when I'm working on a project. So, for example, Thomas um, and I have known each other probably about 18 years. Um, I believe I was about 19 when I first met you over at East West Players. And even though we haven't always kept in touch over the years, like we always kind of find each other, you know, and here we are almost 20 years later. Um, and then Mia, you know, we worked pretty consistently together on Super Ordinary for two years, the past two years. And then Kazumi, you're an example of somebody, you're an example of somebody where I put a casting breakdown um, and looked for auditions and I cast it, casted you directly off of your tape and your reels. And, um, the first time I met you was actually when we were doing voiceover production. So with all these different sort of like levels of relationship, my question is, what is it that inspired, um, inspired or motivated or convinced you to come and work on this project? And why? Why did it appeal to you? And whoever wants to jump in can jump in. Sure, I can. Oh, look, it's Erica. Hey, hi, <laughs> hi, Erica. I'm sorry I'm late. It's been, <laughs> wow, what a morning it has yeah. been. Well, we figured people were probably maybe distracted today. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I woke up to like 50 texts. So, you know, sorry. I am no here. Word. Hello. I'm glad to be here. Yay. Oh, wait. Introduce yourself. We're already live. So just introduce your name oh, to everyone. Hi. I'm Erica Ishii. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was so happy to be part of the project. Cool. Cool. 
And the first question that I just asked for everyone essentially was along the lines of what convinced you slash inspired you slash motivated you to actually work on this project. And then was there somebody who wanted to who wanted to start? I mean, I can. Uh, I okay, originally, okay. originally you asked me, Julia, to to read for for the for the children. I think, um, which is interesting because we had worked together on Super Ordinary, which is an audio drama, and I play the lead, Annika, and she she's a teenager. She sounds like my my face voice is sort of what she sounds like. Um, but I think at some point we had been goofing around in the booth, me and Brigan, and I we made some disgusting like really gross like beanie noises, and I think you emailed me and you were like, so like, I heard you do a thing. <laughs> That's and right. I was wondering if you would employ that professionally in a serious <laughs> way. And as a 24 year old woman, would you mind voicing a literal child for me? And then after I was like, oh, sure, of course, anything. And then I read the script um, with you at your house and with Erica and we were reading through and I was like, this is actually really lovely. Like it's a really interesting story. And I love that um, it's sort of like a, like a historical sort of take. Um, and I think it, I love that it's animated. <clears throat> and then you were like, will you, uh, <coughs> will you voice a literal baby, not just a child, but a baby? And I was like, I, I will, I will do my best. And it turned out okay. So yeah, that, that, that's my story. I really, really, um, I think Dragonfly is really lovely. And I think it's gonna be gorgeous once everything comes together. I'm very excited. Yay. Oh, hold on. Let me see. <laughs> mm. Oh, okay, 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 okay. There we go, there we go. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, I remember that's, I had forgotten about that. Yeah, watching you on Super Ordinary uh, and hearing you mess around. And then you have this clip on your reel too that was you oh. like, kind of like, you looked like Dora the Explorer and you were speaking, oh. you know what I'm talking about? Speaking in this yeah. little girl's there's voice. A, there's a sketch on my reel where I play, um, not Dora the Explorer, but um, it's like, it's like some, it's like Isabella the Mafiosa. It's just like a parody of Dora, but I use like yeah. my worst child voice and it was, it was fun, but I, I, I see, I see where you, where you, where you got that from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, okay, perfect. All right. Anyone else want to answer that question? I'll go. I'll go. Okay. Okay. I mean, we've known each other for quite a while, and um, we've worked on several different projects together. And when I, uh, you know, I mean, to tell you the truth, if you asked me to do anything, I would just do it because <laughs> I mean, we've been, you know, we've known each other for so long. But I mean, this particular project is also very important, and. Um, you know, it, it addressed something that uh, is not spoken about a lot. And, um, well, I mean, they touch on it in uh, Great Fireflies, but, but that is a heartbreaking mm. movie, man. So, uh, and it, it's addressed in a different way in this one. Uh, so, you know, I just, I just felt like uh, it was a, an important project to be a part of. That's all. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm glad you... Agreed. <laughs> I basically do whatever you tell me. I okay. I'll keep that in mind for you know the next time I want to do something insane, insanely wild. That's my best stuff. Uh -huh. All right, Kazumi or Erica, no pressure. Okay, well I'll go. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi. Well, so we never worked together, but um, when I saw the post, uh, the breakdowns, and I, I haven't really done so many animation stuff, but I always wanted to do voiceover work, and, and I've done voiceover work, but I don't know if I've done animation, and I just always wanted to do it. And the subject matters. Um, I was born and raised in Japan, so um, I grew up watching films and TV shows with that, you know, dealing with the subject matter, but I didn't know if... Like, I guess most of you are like born and raised here in the US, yep. I'm assuming. So I yep, didn't yep. know if you guys, um, you guys knew about that particular subject matter, you know, Tokyo bombings. Maybe a lot of people know about Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, but you know, even me, like grew up in Japan, I, I watched a lot of that, 
like films and shows, but it was like something like that happened so long ago and it was sort of like foreign to me. And I think a lot of young people in Japan now, it's like, it's like a happening in another life, but it's not that long ago though. It's like 75 years ago and that's not that long ago. And, and it could still happen to any of us really, if you really think about it, which is a scary thing and it is happening in you know other parts of the world, but it shouldn't be happening. So I think it's good to, you know, tell a story that that we can learn from. And um, so I just wanted to be part of that storytelling. Awesome. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I think, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think your um, assumption is correct for me, at least in terms of I grew up let's see, mostly, I would say I was a 90s kid. But so public school for me, um, growing up in the 80s and 90s, um, when you learn about World War II, it's primarily um, the, the Western side of it. And, but you do learn about, well, at least I, we learned about Pearl Harbor and we learned about the atomic bombs. Um, and I think when I was growing up, they touched a little bit on Japanese internment here in the country. But I actually had never heard of um, any of the fire bombings because the Tokyo fire bombing is the biggest one. But there are hundreds, hundreds of fire bombings in Japan um, throughout World War II. And then uh, there was the Dresden fire bombing in Europe. So that uh, some people are more familiar with. But I had never heard of it until I was an adult and I made a point. Like I, I hit that age where I was finally like, I want to learn about my family heritage. <laughs> I just hit that age, like in my early twenties. And then, you know, I learned a little bit. I interviewed my parents and I learned like a little bit from my mom about her parents, but even she didn't know very much. And I remember her saying something like, yeah, no, I think my parents were in Tokyo, but then there was some kind of big fire and they had to leave. And I'm like, so I start Googling like Tokyo fire. <laughs> that's it that's all i had like tokyo really <laughs> it uh and that's where i learned about the fire bombing and it kind of went from there so yeah i think you're you're some kind of fire in tokyo that was the did i the lose knowledge? everybody i oh uh, yeah i think you're i think your connection might have dropped for a second there oh but i hear you now Sort of. Oh, yeah. She's I, think, I, think we're, I think we're losing Julia a little bit. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, Julia's freezing in and out a little bit. Hello, oh, Julia. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Everybody else is moving. Yeah. Oh, no. Um, in the meantime, though, Erica, I oh, wanted to say I love your makeup. <laughs> Crazy. It. Oh, my Incredible. gosh. By the way, okay. Uh, you know, I'm not being sponsored or anything, but like, Magnetic lashes, like are <laughs> game changer. I think we lost Julie for a second, but like I think I think I assume that the uh, stream is still going. Mm -hmm. I think because I think we're still live. So like uh, in case we are still live, I guess I'll mention what, or I don't know if I should wait or something. <laughs> we, we should wait for oh there she is. <laughs> <laughs> it's too hey, you're back. Oh, there's two of me though there's like a blank yeah. <laughs> That's funny. let me see if i can let me remove that okay all awesome. right i don't know like when i cut out but yeah erica go yeah. okay uh, <laughs> great um so uh i actually was familiar with your work because of the bright sessions i'd worked on a um a web series with Lauren Shippen, uh, who is the creator, writer, and actress in uh, the Bright Sessions, which is a podcast, like a, a narrative podcast. And uh, Julia was the lead character in that, Dr. Bright. And so I was familiar with your work as an actor there. Um, and then I followed you on Twitter and I saw that there were other projects that you were a part of. And at each one of them, uh, centered stories by and including people of color. And that was, it's, uh, you know, even now in 2020, uh, a lot rarer 
to see. And uh, at some point, Julia reached out to me uh, asking if I wanted to be part of this project. And she sent the scripts to me and I read it and it was it was a topic again. Yeah, I, as everybody has mentioned, it's not something that we learn very much about. Um, definitely not here in the US. My family was actually on the other side of the war. Uh, they were all in the internment camps. Uh, they they ended up enlisting in uh, one side was on in the 442, one side was military intelligence. Um, and a lot of, in American history is definitely glossed over um, specifically about uh, wartime, wartime terrors committed in other countries. And so it was, I, I really didn't know a ton about the firebombings um, other than, you know, a couple of teachers in high school sort of went above and beyond the curriculum to, uh, you know, sort of a lot of times when we hear numbers during war, uh, you know, they're numbers and we don't connect them to stories and narratives and uh, tragedy. And so seeing, you know, hearing accounts and 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 seeing that illustrated and, you uh, in the script was was very visceral. And so I was glad, glad that I got to be a part of it. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, Kazumi, I found you. Let me add you back on. Okay. I, I didn't hear any of it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's okay. All we did was talk, talk about you. <laughs> what, I know. I'm like trying it? to multitask okay, so, here. Okay. I don't know. So it wasn't my connection. Just gonna, it just was disrupted. I, I have no idea. You did disappear okay. from my end for a moment, and then you came back. Okay, um, all right. Yeah, and as far as I can tell, I can still see and hear you. I have no idea. The live stream video might end up being frozen. Whatever. <laughs> it's, I, there are so many more things to be stressed about right now that it's fine. <laughs> um. Okay. Can I, so, can I can I say something real fast? Please. Oh, I just I just think it's kind of cool that there are like just even in this one project with like the six or so voice actors that there's like, uh, <clears throat> you know, that uh, the, ex the personal experiences of the people uh, expand, you know, like uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding my words, but, uh, you know, like just encompass the whole spectrum. I mean, you have people who were born in Japan who have that experience, who learned about uh, this particular experience from that point of view. And then you have the mainland born Japanese uh, <clears throat> who are, you know, experiencing this particular experience from that point of view. And I'm from Hawaii, so I have a unique point of view myself because I learned about most of this stuff uh, fairly early in my life. But, uh, you know, I just think it's interesting that just amongst the cast, there's like this whole spectrum of people who have different experiences uh, about the same event that mm. you know, reaches out into all of our lives you know what i mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's interesting because you know uh the japanese you know so like the nikkei diaspora like it's we have these different completely different experiences because you know uh japanese born uh Japanese citizens or Japanese born Americans or Americans that are of Japanese ancestry, like have such vastly different cultural upbringings and sort of cultural knowledge and, uh, you know, sort of attitudes about things. But I think in, in the end, we sort of all share, I don't know, I think I, I was Yoshiko Uchida who said, you know, even with the um, American born Japanese, that there's an invisible thread that sort of ties us to the motherland, you know, in, in, in a way that, I don't know, there, there are other cultures that, you know, once you get a couple of generations removed, in, in some ways it's, it's like when you're Japanese or when you're Asian, you're sort of always gonna be considered a perpetual foreigner. And that is negative, but at the same time, I feel like I'm a lot more in touch with my cultural heritage because of it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I know that was part of my, what kind of inspired me to start looking into my heritage because at, at some point in my early adulthood, all of a sudden I realized like 
I actually have no, I feel like I have no thread um, connecting me to my heritage. I actually have no idea um, anything about my family heritage and not to sound like, uh, like for sure, like not intending to um, play on a stereotype here, but I definitely have um, come from a family where we don't really talk about our family history and especially like for for me like i never met any of my grandparents because they all passed away before i was born except one um my grandmother who's featured in dragonfly yoshiko my mom's mom she died when i was young but she was in japan um so i never met her so it's just kind of that thing and i kind of feel like it's similar I don't know for sure, but even like when I interviewed my parents about their upbringing, it was, especially on my mom's side, it was still very vague. Like it was very like, oh, I think this is what my parents were doing during the war. Cause they probably didn't talk about it and share about it once, you know, their kids were born after the war. Um, so I feel like that, I don't know. There's always just been such a disconnect for me that, um, in a way it's kind of sad, <laughs> in a way it's kind of sad. <laughs> um, and I've always wanted to kind of find that, um, I don't know. Yeah. Just focusing a lot of my creative energy now on finding that, um, that actually makes me wonder, like, um, having, having said what I just said, like about my family history, I'm curious, Kazumi, how that rings, how that, kind of resonates with you being born and raised in Japan, hearing like a Japanese American person being like, yeah, we don't, I don't know anything about family history. Yeah. But I was gonna, I was gonna say to you, like what I was just listening to what you're saying, but it's not just a cultural thing. It's a generational mm -hmm. thing as well. I mean, I was born and raised in Japan and, and I lived with my gram grandma and I talked to my grandparents and they experienced war, but they didn't really talk about it. You know, it was not something that they really talked about it. I watched movies and like TV shows that were dealing with like the war subjects. So that's where I learned things from, but I think they didn't really like to talk about things like that. So um, yeah, I was just thinking that as I was listening to you and um, I think that should change. That's why I felt like I needed to be like part of things like that. Like I, I'm, I was always interested in like doing a project that has to do with like Hiroshima bombings, and and I didn't really think about Tokyo bombings because I think it was just sort of like removed from my psyche as well, from my memory, even though um, I grew up in Japan. So yeah. I think it's important to tell those stories so that the young generation, younger generations, can remember. And this was not that long ago, you know. Right. And we shouldn't repeat that. And growing up in Japan, I did not know anything about uh, internment camps. Okay? Mm. This is something that we didn't learn. And this is something that I learned since I moved here. And it's there's like a disconnect between like Japanese, Japanese people from like, and like Japanese Americans, but we are all Japanese. You know what I mean? So like that kind of uh, cultural disconnect, I mean, it's just like what uh, Erica was saying about like age, um, I don't know exactly what I wanted to say, but like, well, like, okay, I'm Japanese, born and raised, but I'm American. And I consider myself like Japanese probably first and, and Asian and Asian American, and, and but, but mostly I'm a human being. And I think we just really need to be able to connect to that, but also honor our heritage and culture. So just to tell personal stories from each culture and share with the whole world, I think that's very important as, a, as an artist and, and filmmakers, as an actor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does um, that answer my, your question? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, like, and that's, that actually um, is something that I'm kind of focusing on, like with the the larger story that I've been working on for you know over a decade now. That this short comes from is both sides, because that story focuses on both the internment side and the um, 
the, the well, I guess I should say the American side and the Japanese side. And um, that cultural difference. And yet you still feel connected and yet mm -hmm. you still feel so far away. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know. We kind of got into like some some deeper subject matter. Does anybody else have anything to say on this topic while we're here? Uh, I could, I don't know. I was just thinking about, um, I think like Asian American like culture. And I think every like specific, like different cultural group within like that big old umbrella of like Asian American has their own sort of struggle. I think, especially like Japanese Americans, we have a struggle bus of like, well, Asian American general, I think like have a struggle bus of not really having a, resident culture as Asian Americans. Like there's nothing really to latch on to. Um, and I think that's why we sort of all like, you know, especially in Japanese Americans, I feel like they westernize pretty quickly. Um, at least that's in my experience. And I'm also like, <laughs> I'm also half Japanese, half Korean. So I grew up sort of like, I was a lot closer with my Japanese side and my bachan is my only grandparent that's still alive. Um, and she, I, my dad was really, really intent on like, every historical project I did for school had to be about like Japanese history, especially the Hiroshima bombing. So that's where my boyfriend's from. Um, so I would interview her about these things. And it's interesting because you guys said that, you know, they don't really want to talk about it. Um, she wasn't vague at all, but she wasn't sad. Like there's, I don't sense any sense of like somber energy from her when she talks about these things. She's actually, quite, she might just be weird. I wouldn't be surprised if she's just a weirdo because <laughs> and her family's insane. But when I ask her about it, every single time I go, Bachan, can you tell me about the bombings? She says, she always gets this look on her face and she goes, hmm, oh, well, I was on a, I went into the mountains that day because I was on a field trip. And then I looked to the city and there was this big cloud, really big. Yeah, yeah, it was really big. And she just like has this look on her face of lead. That shit was huge. It was, there's like no, I'm sure she, she's already, she's also an old woman. So she's gone through cycles of grief. And I feel like it doesn't wear on her like very presently, but you know, she doesn't seem to like affect her strikingly. She's just like this, it happened, big, big cloud. And when I ask her about, you know, wartime, cause she's, she was a, an arranger with my Ji-chan. Um, she, she doesn't, I don't know, she's so, and I feel like it's a strength, maybe even in like older generations, it's just like this very sort of stalwart strength. I'll ask her, you know, how was, you know, was it really tough having to go through that? Having to go through like wartime, you know? And she was like, I mean, yeah, I had to eat bugs, but like, whatever. <laughs> like, it, it is what it is. I'm fine now. Like, mm -hmm. and I think it's really, it's just really interesting to see. And it's inspiring in a way to be able to know that like, she's been so resilient through like, for so long, like she's in her 80s. She's truly just like <laughs> fighting onwards at all times. Um, I don't know. It's not really a concrete thought necessarily, but it's really interesting to hear that there's sort of this weird sense of like grounded strength amongst like older generations of Japanese people and Japanese Americans. I don't know, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, once some time has passed, one, you know, your grief, kind of changes into something where it I don't it's just kind of like yeah that that's just what happened that's just what happened and yeah. you know nothing we can do about it now but um I know I would love to I need to meet some if you want to send any of your grandparents my way <laughs> I would love to meet some older generation Japanese or Japanese Americans um I need a translator <laughs> My grandma is doing her best. <laughs> that is the thing. Wait, um, anyone other than uh, Kazumi speak uh, Japanese? I'm not fluent, but I I am like conversational, and I've been working with a tutor on it this year. So, oh, good same. <laughs> yeah, because that's the thing is that uh, you know once you get far enough removed, I mean, and I don't know. He was saying that, yeah, Japanese had to integrate, especially from in a certain generation, like I'm Yonze. So I'm like super American. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I know that my grandparents had to assimilate super hard because of the war. Um, and, you know, they, they came from a generation in which, you know, you, you were taught you really had to sort of integrate into American society um, and sort of forget your cultural upbringing. Um, and so by the time it got to me, I'm, I, you know, was not raised speaking Japanese. I had, I studied Nihon Buyo, the uh, Japanese dance growing up. Uh, we did the holidays. I'm also, uh, multicultural in that, you know, I'm part Chinese and Indian, but, you know, I was closer with my Japanese side. And so we did the holidays and I knew food things and polite phrases to say, but I grew up. Uh, not speaking Japanese. And so now that I'm older, like Julia, I've been trying to get more in touch with that and to get fluent. And also as an actor, if you look Asian, you better know how to speak an Asian language um, <laughs> yeah. or at least have the accent. I mean, I've done, you know, my, my Japanese pronunciation is pretty good. And, you know, my Japanese accent is, oh, is pretty good. And so I've done roles where I've done that, um, even though I am very obviously American. Uh, and it's so interesting to have to reclaim that cultural heritage um, for all the different reasons. My my tutor was talking about like the different reasons why a lot of heritage learners are relearning Japanese. Interesting. Hmm. That's cool. I just want to throw in that I recently lost a job because I can't speak Japanese. Like, like, an, act, like an acting job? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was a really good role, too. It was a regular role in a TV series, and uh, I lost it. because Did I you go in for Oh, sorry. Pardon? Sorry, ignore me. I was just saying that's really annoying. That's really, really annoying, especially when you consider how... Like I wasn't encouraged necessarily to learn because then it's like you get made fun of, you know, there's that whole one bit, like warning about like you don't want to seem too much like a foreign, you want to Americanize yourself as much as possible. I grew up in a very like, it was like a pretty big Japanese American community where I grew up, but I had all white friends growing up and where I was specifically like living on a farm, like in the middle of Fresno, you know, I got made fun of a lot and I, I didn't even think that maybe I should start learning Japanese until like this year. I realized my grandma's like old, which is such a horrible thing to say, but I was like, she's old. I want to be able to like have a full conversation with her instead of this like struggle bus of me going, hi, Vachan, and her going, hello. And then I don't really get to know the person she is, even though I can see her personality is so strong and she's so like alive and funny. And I can't get past that first language barrier and it's really aggravating. So that's why I started learning Japanese. And even so, like she, <laughs> I'm not good enough to the point of like having conversations. So I know certain things and I'm getting better every week with my tutor, but I tried telling her happy birthday and I said, you know, I'm and she laughed at me. She was like, why are you doing that? And I was like, because I want to talk to you. And she was like, well, get better. <laughs> so I know it's just frustrating to hear. I'm sorry, Thomas. <laughs> I Did mean, no, don't get me wrong. I mean, I feel like they should probably give it to a Nihonjin because, you know, I can't speak Japanese. <laughs> I <laughs> agree. <laughs> I know, but it's frustrating on our end as well, though, when they cast um, Jap the Kuli or Japanese role to uh, mm -hmm. like an Jap American actor who clearly, clearly doesn't speak the language because American audience can't tell, but I can tell. You know, so that's sort of frustrating too, but so it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. but. That actually reminds me earlier this year, right, Kazumi? So I got an audition for a, a TV show. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite TV shows that came out earlier this year, actually, for their next season. And um, it was clearly a person of Japanese descent and who was an immigrant. So I knew that going in. So I assumed going in, accent would be required. I got the sides. The sides were written in Japanese in hiragana. Oh. And I looked at them oh. and I was like, I can't read these. So I had to politely um, decline the audition. But, um, you know, I felt kind of bad because they had already given me the slot. So I forwarded um, um, casting to Kazumi. Did they follow through with you ever? Uh, I don't, well, I think the production is on hold or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. You, I mean, I did go to an audition. Yeah, I did go to an audition. That okay. was good. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, I remember being like, oh, whoops. Um, 
Yeah, but I, yeah, I, I can see that. No, I can see what you're saying about but, that. But, but, but also I was just like, um, recently a friend of mine just told me that this is what Japanese audience said to like, uh, my Japanese uh, actor's friend, um, his brother said like, everybody watches everything on Netflix now and it's like dubbed. So they don't care if the Japanese like accent is wrong because it's gonna be dubbed anyway, which is kind of sad. So I don't know, <laughs> you know? Let me but they're you. looking at acting, like, you know, because it's gonna be dubbed. They certainly um, cared about accent on this project. Hey, hey, which one was it? I can't, I can't say. say. You can't say, okay. Can't say, but when, when, when we're off the air, when we're off air. A lot of the projects now, they do really care because I yeah. think, which is kind of good in a way because like, it's not about an accent or a language alone. Like, I mean, specifically now, like if they're casting Japanese people, like the, the character's Japanese, they're really asking for Japanese actors, like Jap at least like a Japanese part Japanese or something just to honor uh, cultural heritage or something. I don't know, maybe just they're being politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's better. It's better. But yeah. like, my signs were in kanji, so I sent it to my friend who translated them phonetically for me, and I know enough Japanese that I can I can fake it. Yeah, I, I think that's okay. If you and can... I told them I don't speak Japanese now, but I'm I'm faking it phonetically, and they were like, okay, okay. And then they audition. They gave me a second audition, and I told them I don't really speak Japanese now, and they're like, yes, yes, yes. So I you know I did it phonetically, and they were like, okay, and then. And they put me on a veil. They and shouldn't they said, have done that to you. <laughs> and they gave me another sides in kanji, and they said they wanted in a kansai dialect, and I was like, Oh my this god! Is so oh, I know which one you're talking about. Okay, that's yeah. impossible. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, yeah. That's too far. I can't do that. That's impossible. Yeah. Like that's me, even we like, even for me, if I have to do something in kansai dialect, which I had to do, it's not easy. <laughs> Cause it's a they can tell like people from Kansai can tell if it's a fake accent or not I have my dad is from Kansai so I think I can sort of I, I grew up listening to it so I can sort of do it but even then it's not, yeah and so it's I was like easy. you gotta do this to a Nihonjin because I cannot that's not something I can fake right like no 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 that's uh, <laughs> that's very difficult that's insane it's funny because yeah, once again, there there's really a difference between the experiences um, in America of people who are like grown grown up, like born and raised in Japan versus you know American born. And it's you know as I said, it's the idea of the sort of perpetual foreigner in that like the reason that we have to learn Japanese or like be fluent in Japanese or you know have these specific things. Um, is because a lot of the roles that are available for Japanese Americans or for Asian Americans are as foreign born uh, people in America or just are not American or English speaking. Whereas like, you know, somebody who is of French descent doesn't automatically have to know French and put it on their resume. Um, and it's, so it's interesting, like the, that is the reason why we need more diverse voices um, on the writing side as well, you know, in, you know, bringing it back to uh, Dragonfly and, and to Julia's projects, it's, you know, we, a lot of times, and coming from digital media, we have had to create the roles that we wanted to see out in the world. We have to tell our own stories. Um, I love seeing you know, more representation in general, seeing Japanese actors playing Japanese roles uh, and, you know, having stories set in Japan. But I also want to see uh, people that are, you know, born and raised in Japan, but here in America or Americans who are Japanese descent or like Hawaiian, even the Hawaiian Japanese experience is so different from mainland uh, Japanese American experience. Uh, and then so I feel like, we just have to sort of write our own stories and people them with, you know, a diversity of uh, performers. Yeah, totally. absolutely. Yeah. I also just want to throw in, I'm totally grateful to get the audition. <laughs> like calling me. I am, if anybody's listening, I'm totally grateful. <laughs> I really appreciate it and thank you. And please continue auditioning me. 
I just can't speak Japanese. I mean, that's. I know. I've got my my husband gave me a Rosetta Stone for Japanese like years ago, and I did. You know, I did like two classes, two semesters in at City College in my early twenties. Before the the first time I went to Japan was two thousand five. So you know, I took a class <laughs> so I could get around and not be completely disrespectful as a tourist um but that's more than most people do that's amazing that's true but it's yeah. hard especially if because especially if you go to someplace like tokyo where there's so much english and everything is in pictures so you know yeah. like you can order food just by pointing at a picture like they cater to tourists assuming that we we're not going to speak japanese so it's actually quite easy at least in like a major city like tokyo to get around as a tourist but um yeah yeah. So I don't know. Huh? Sorry, sorry. Japanese oh, no, is difficult for you guys to learn. I mean, it's a it's not an easy language to learn. Uh, you know, it's funny because I think growing up and around it enough and like learning enough of it, it's at least the phonetics are so super simple, especially yeah. there are a set number of phonetics, whereas in yeah. English it's anybody's guess, really. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, compared to having to learn English, anybody else having to learn English, it is yeah, that's so that's hard. Simple because it's like a sentence structure that that is sort of the same. Like once you know that sentence structure, it kind of unlocks everything. And mm -hmm. uh, like only certain ways to say certain things. The one thing that always gets me is kanji. My hiragana oh. and my mm -hmm. katakana are like I can always brush those up, and those are fine, yeah. but. Man, kanji, it's just like, if you don't know it, there's no way of figuring it out. You just have to yeah. sort of like figure it out, you know? So yeah. kanji, but you know, I mean, Japanese itself is like, it's it's a complex language, but it's makes sense, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. That makes sense, yeah. unlike English. I yeah, really it makes more sense. Yeah, I really love learning it. I feel like I grew up like hearing it, and then I also watch a lot of Japanese TV and like anime, like just to enjoy it. But then I realize because I hear it so often, there are just certain sentence structures that, even though I have literally never spoken it before, like fluently or even like conversationally, my tutor is like surprised every week. He's like, "Oh, you you caught that quite like quite quickly." Um, I'm glad, and I'm like, "Yeah, I'm." I get, I get it. It makes sense, and it like, like Eric said, you just like unlock like, like certain sentence structures and like particles, and you're like, everything is beautiful, and I can like struggle with us, but I can figure out what to say. Um, the only thing I will say is that like, I think it's so interesting that there's just like a very, it's like general. You just have to be very polite. Um, yeah. Like my tutor, Kada, he's very funny. He thinks I'm, he thinks I'm insane. Like every week, he asks me like what I did the night before how my week is going. And I always joke that I'm like, I drank a lot. Like I drank a lot of booze. And he always gets so uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> and I I'm like, I'm joking, I'm joking, kind of. And he's like, oh. And he always just goes, so, 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 so. Uh, anyway. <laughs> and that's what I think. I he's, he's also from Japan, moved here. He lives in Arcadia. He's like a Japanese uh, teacher and he majored in English um, in Japan in college. So. I feel like that's also a very different experience is like him trying to teach a Japanese American, like, like you know, idiot, like <laughs> cultural language. And I'm like, I'm a disaster every day. <laughs> <sighs> well, um, on, yeah, on the note of Mia is a disaster. No, I don't have, I don't have anything. <laughs> no, continue, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, I guess, I don't know, changing the subjects, maybe like, um, I, I would love to kind of know um, people's experience with, because um, we were talking about sort of some of the expectations that there are um, as a actor uh, of Japanese descent and wondering like how if if you have any experience of that translating in voiceover differently than on camera where you uh for example um assuming you're not doing additionally doing motion capture or anything you 
you know, your appearance is not seen and it's just your voice. And if you have a very American voice, how, how you feel sort of the opportunities in the voiceover community are either different or the same from opportunities on camera? I have things to say about that, but if anybody else would like to go first, please. No? I mean, you would have the most experience, right, Erica? Yeah, I think I, probably. I'm so, so far, I'm sorry, there's a leaf blower happening somewhere here. Uh, but I, I am so, so, so fortunate to be able to say that, you know, I, at, like I make most of my living as a voiceover actor. Uh, I came, my journey is different than anybody else's really. Everybody in voiceover has some weird origin story. Like they came, they're from music, they, they're in a band, they were like a game developer. Like, so I, I mostly do video games. Um, I, I do some animation, I've done some commercial, but my sort of mainstay is video games. and. It's great, I love it. I've been so fortunate to get to play such a diversity of roles that are available to me, available to me because uh, yeah, it technically doesn't matter what you look like. That being said, uh, most of the roles that I'm known for uh, and most of my bigger role, most of my roles are uh, Asian American or Asian women uh, because you know, right now there's a push for diversity. Uh, they are, for a very long time, the industry has still been dominated uh, by uh, white actors. Um, and so there were a lot of white actors playing uh, roles by uh, black, indigenous people of color. Uh, and now there, you know, there's, there's the argument like, well, yes, anybody can play anything, but if that's the case, then why was it that all these roles uh, that are for people of color are not played by people of color. And so there is the pendulum is swinging the other way and they are looking for people to be ethnically true to the characters. But then also there's the question of like, well, does that mean I can't do a voice somebody who is has an American voice, but is of Korean descent? Does that like, at what point are we, you know, sort of starting to break up those categories? Like in a post racial society, it'll truly be the best actor for the role. But for right now, because there are still, whether it's, you know, connections or uh, education or opportunities or, uh, you know, like, unconscious bias, you know, it, it is still uh, harder for people of color. And definitely for my black voice actor friends, you know, you get the question of like, oh, well you sound too urban is the uh, code word for it now. Sorry, I went on this whole thing, but yeah, there's so much, there, the racial politics of voiceover is so fascinating because while yes, like there are so many more opportunities available because it, you don't, it doesn't matter what you look like, there are still doors that are closed and there is still a glass ceiling. And I am been very, 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 very fortunate um, that I have agents that will give me, I told them I will not read for characters that are uh, Latina or black or indigenous or like these certain things, you know, um, because I want those roles to go to the appropriate ethnicities. Um, but they have championed me. They will send me out for anything else that they feel I am right for, regardless of race. Um, and they have pushed for me for roles that, you know, do not match my, for, for white, for Caucasian leading roles. Um, and, you know, my, my team and the casting studios that I've worked with have been very, very good about that. But there's still kind of a battle to be fought in that regard. It's, we're still feeling it out. <laughs> Thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the TED talk. Uh, does any, anybody else, any thoughts? I mean, no problem. I mean, that's really cool. I think that's really cool. Um, 
I honestly think Erica specifically is like sort of like an icon within sort of like video game voiceover industry to be able to see like a badass like Asian American woman like killing it. Um, I have friends who are like they're losing their mind that I get to be on a camera with her. Um, Check your face. I'm I'm like I'm so dead ass, Erica. I kid you not. I have friends who are like watching right now. Um, Watching right now. Yeah, if you, you could you could say hello to Dylan and he'll lose his mind. Hi, Dylan. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Um, but yeah, I think it's so cool. And I, I don't know. I feel like I've had conversations with friends, even like in the audio drama community, about like you know how it's where do you draw the line? And my personal thing, I always think is like I am gonna take whatever role I can, like within reason. You know, obviously I'm not gonna voice someone who isn't. I think I would draw the line at like same thing as Erica. Like you don't don't do anything that is more appropriate for like indigenous folks, black folks, like like Latino folks, like whatever it is. Um, like I'll take a white person's role. I don't care. I'll do it. Give it to me. Um, but until then, even if like the roles are uncomfortable or even borderline offensive, like taking it and being able to run and have success and then being able to change it once you're in a position of power, because I'm, I'm a super. I'm still very much a greenhorn. I feel like in terms of like the industry, um, both voiceover and like on camera. And sometimes I get roles where I'm like, man, this is sus. Um, but someday I'd like to be able to be like, I'm the one writing. I'm the one controlling what's going on, and I will be able to say, like, with confidence, this is something I'm proud to put out. That anybody who auditioned for it would be like happy to do so. Um, so that would be nice for like. You know, and like you said, in a post racial society, that'd be great, but we, racism is real. It is real. It is going to be real for a while. So we're going to do what we can until then. That's the answer. Awesome. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that reminds me of when I, I think specifically for Mia and Erica, when I first reached out to you, like in spring of 2019. I didn't want to make any assumptions and I'm pretty sure my first email was like, Hey, do you identify as Japanese? Japanese? Yeah. 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 That was that. Yeah. Yeah. No reason. Cause it is, I mean, there is like, I'm not going to get into that fine line be- between what is politically correct and, and you know what? Yeah. I just can't, there, that is such a weighted argument. It's not necessarily about being like politically correct. It's that, you know, traditionally most of the roles available have been Caucasian characters, you know, that is, and it, that is still the way it is. Um, just statistically, those are numbers. And so there have been subsequently less opportunities for people of color to play roles that, you know, are for people of color um, and, you know, or or any other roles, and the idea of, of me, me saying like I'll take a Caucasian role, it's like yeah, that's kind of what is available right now. You know, if I said I will only do Asian and Asian American roles, um, I would be working a lot less. You know, and that's not fair. And so one day we're just going to have this diversity of stories that anybody can play roles in. You know, or and, and like anybody really truly can play anything. And again, I feel like in voiceover there, there are opportunities that are just not as not available in on camera. Like there are so many more opportunities, but yeah, like there there is still considerations being made. And I'm just proud of the community that everybody's working through it together, you know? Like I, I know so many people that are, have like turned down roles because they knew it wasn't the right thing to do um, or, you know, we all sort of take care of each other. If there's, you know, an Asian role out, we kind of text each other and are like, hey, are you reading on something? Like, does your agent know about this project maybe? Like, eh, agents, if you're watching, that's not definitely not something we do. But like, you know, the industry is very small and everybody takes care of each other and looks out for each other and is respectful um, and sort of supports each other um, even if, they might be going for the same role. It's beautiful. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's something I always heard about um, as someone who's kind of like on the edges of the voiceover community, but not working in any mainstream sort of like video game or animation. Um, 
markets, I've always been told that the voiceover community is like the nicest community in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I definitely, I know for me, for this project, it was really important um, for me to cast people specifically of Japanese ancestry and not just of the sort of generic East Asian um, ancestry. And, um, you know, that's one of those uh, lines, like where is the line sort of question, but just for me, that's that's what I wanted. Um, am I allowed to, and it's kind of like weird, like as a producer, am I allowed to say that? You know, it's, I mean, it's just, a, it's a sensitive subject. I, it's no matter what, it kind of like what, no matter what, there's probably always gonna be somebody who is offended. So, so there's that. Um, well, so like we have about like five minutes left I want to open it up to anybody to either say anything that you'd like or to um, promote any other projects that you have going on right now whoever I mean somebody somebody uh, I, uh, listen to super ordinary and the sword and the stoner um on spotify and apple podcasts i do voiceover for tandem productions and i play annika in super ordinary and i play izzy in sword and the stoner sword and the stoner is a very very funny funny show if you don't want to listen to something dramatic like super ordinary um they're very fun they're very good um that is what i have to say <laughs> amazing anyone else uh, Rogue Artists and East West Players are putting out an app in uh, December, I think, which is an extension of the Kaidan project, which was a play that they did a few years ago. Uh, that's coming out that I helped with production and I did some voiceover for. Also, um, I'm going to start uh, being a stunt coordinator for a, a feature length independent horror film that's going to start shooting in January. So. That's called Face On. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, I don't really have anything to promote, um, but I just want to say thank you to you, Julia, just to letting me be part of this project. And it was so much fun. And um, just to be part of you guys and just i learned a lot from listening to you guys today so um so thank you for letting me part of it hello uh oh did we lose yeah, did we like lose? Stuck <laughs> stuck on me. Do a dance. you're beautiful just just hang <laughs> uh i guess that's me um yeah uh, time for my call to action. I'm Erica Ishii. You can find me at Erica Ishii on Twitter um, and at the Erica Ishii on Instagram. Uh, let's see. What can I? Uh, I live in NDAs and I need to figure, I need to just make a list or something. Um, I guess on the 10th, uh, Destiny 2's Beyond Light update drops. Uh, I think I can say, yeah, play that. Um yeah, and just there's so much coming out this month, but I can't quite say. So I guess just follow me on Twitter and you'll hear about it there. Um, and again, yeah, thank you so much, Julia. This has been great. Yay. Yay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I didn't think of any way to sign out. So Thank you for everybody who's watching. Thank you for everybody who will watch in the future when you know this is stays online somehow. And thank you for everybody who has supported Dragonfly so far. We the campaign ends on Thursday, uh, November twelfth. Twelfth, yep, at eleven a.m. Pacific Standard Time. It is at dragonflyshortfilm.com. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, and we'll see you around. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>